Hello everyone and welcome to the Exemplar Research Project, striving for exceptional services for people affected by bladder cancer, a study to define an exemplar service. This is the virtual roundtable report launch. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got people from uh, around the world, uh, United Kingdom, I can see people from uh, Brussels, the Netherlands, Canada. It's so wonderful to have you all here with us. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Lydia Makarov and I am the Chief Executive of Fight Bladder Cancer. So this is uh, the, uh, we're using a Zoom platform here for this webinar. So you can look at the bottom of your uh, toolbar and you will see chat. So the chat is open um, for everyone. So feel free to introduce yourself to the other attendees uh, using the chat function. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for any of the panelists as well, you can click on the Q&A button there and you can also vote uh, for any questions that anyone else has answered. And we'll be also asking for uh, your opinion and your feedback uh, via the polls uh, throughout the seminar. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very excited to, we've got such a, a fantastic range of panelists to speak today. So I'm very excited and I really appreciate you joining us. Um, so we've got quite a few different stakeholder groups joining us today. Uh, we've got a lot of patients who are affected by bladder cancer. Uh, we have carers uh, who have been caring by caring for someone affected by bladder cancer. We've got our industry partners who have helped to make this possible. Uh, we have healthcare professionals, uh, we have policymakers uh, and we have researchers as well. Um, and we also have representatives from other uh, charities, uh, other bladder cancer charities from around the world and other charities as well that are associated with bladder cancer. So thank you so much all for joining. Uh, my first speaker today um, is Dorothy. Uh, but before we go that, if we could just move on to the next slide, Laura, that would be wonderful. Uh, so I will take you through the agenda for this afternoon. So uh, a welcome introductory remarks um, from me, and then we will have Dorothy uh, here on the screen as well, uh, an amazing bladder cancer patient um, from Scotland um, who will be talking about the need for an exemplar patient and care experience. Uh, then I will tell you about the uh, bladder cancer uh, exemplar project. Uh, and then for session one, we will be putting in place an exemplar pathway uh, with uh, Dr. Johnston Shaw and Mr. Hugh Mustaford, who will speak um, from their perspective. Uh, we'll have a 10 minute break, uh, very important, uh, especially during these days of homeworking. Uh, and then session two, developing and growing the bladder cancer workforce with uh, Julia Taylor, MBE, and Heather James, two amazing nurses uh, from different locations within the UK. Another 10 minute break. And then session three, uh, improving patient support and involvement in care with uh, our patient Neve Gallagher uh, from Northern Ireland and Tracy Skaskovich, uh, bladder cancer carer and co-founder um, from Fight Bladder Cancer. And then we will have some uh, closing remarks um, from me. So next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, we are truly grateful uh, to Estellas Bristol Myers Squibb the Merck Pfizer Alliance, MSD and Roche uh, for their support in covering the costs associated with the exemplar project and to Arca Diagnostics for funding the online survey conducted by BrainCell. Uh, all the editorial control of all of the materials has been retained uh, by Fight Bladder, Bladder Cancer. We are responsible for the scope and the contents of everything that you will see uh, today, but we're very, very truly grateful for our industry partners for uh, helping us, uh, supporting us in this project. So thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So as I've said, uh, welcome uh, very much um, to, to this. Uh, to this webinar. Uh, it's really one, one of the advantages of having a webinar as well rather than a round table is that we are able to have people from all around the United Kingdom and all around the globe uh, in this global conversation. So thank you uh, so much. And um, it's great uh, to, to see some of uh, the people already introducing us, uh, introducing themselves on the chat. Uh, yes, um, if you're an attendee, you're definitely on mute. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, we've got a question from someone. Um, so yes, it, there's no mute button for any attendees uh, because you're already on mute. So uh, thank you for checking about that. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are today's chair and uh, speakers. So my name, Dr. Lydia Makarov, I'm the chair. And then these are our amazing speakers. We have Dorothy Markham, uh, the Fight Bladder Cancer Trustee and Bladder Cancer Patient. 
Dr. Johnston Shaw, a retired GP and bladder cancer patient. Mr. Hugh Mustaford, a consultant urologist. Uh, Julia Taylor, uh, Macmillan Urology Clinical Nurse Specialist and past president of Bourne. Heather James, Ur Urology Clinical Nurse Specialist. Neve Gallagher, a fight bladder cancer patient representative. And Tracy Stavskovich, a uh, cancer carer and co-founder from Fight Bladder Cancer. Next slide, please. So these are the three roundtable objectives. Um, number one, to hear from bladder cancer experts on the findings and recommendations of Fight Bladder Cancer's exemplar project. Two, build community consensus on recommendations and momentum for implementation. And three, discuss as a community those areas which require further research and exploration. So uh, all of you uh, will have received in the email a copy of this, the exemplar research report, which we're so proud to be launching today. And uh, we will be, throughout the next uh, hours, we will be exploring those recommendations and hearing from various experts around the UK, uh, their thoughts on the recommendations and how we can work together as a community uh, to make sure that everyone who was affected by bladder cancer experiences exemplar service. Next, please. Next slide, please. So I am very proud to introduce Dorothy Markham here, uh, who will be talking about the need for an exemplar patient and carer experience. So Dorothy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. Um, I suppose to really understand why I believe that we need an exemplar project, we need to talk a little bit about my experience. Um, I was diagnosed uh, with cancer in 2015. I worked until I was 79. Um, so my plan was to see more of my family and to um, travel. Unfortunately, that was very short lived and started feeling quite ill. Went to GP, like many other blast cancer sufferers. I've got loads of antibiotics over several months um, until it was really got to the stage where I needed a second opinion. Um, I asked for a second opinion and I was told that I would have to wait several months because by this time it was around about Christmas. Um, so I was able, and I feel very grateful that I was able, though I have some different feelings about this because I've always believed in the National Health Service, but I was able to access private medicine. I got an, um, an examination um, under anaesthetic and they found a stone in my bladder wall, um, but thankfully they also took some biopsies. And in February 2016, um, I was diagnosed with muscular invasive cancer. I saw a consultant who did outline for me what treatments were possible and, and how I would access these. Uh, because of the, because it was muscular invasive, I chose to have the removal of my bladder. I've always thought that I haven't seen a CNS, but now I'm thinking over the last few days, I realise that on that consultation, there was a specialist nurse there, and I was, she talked to myself and my family directly after the consultation. Um, I was fortunate enough, I had my operation on the 29th of April 2016. It went well. Unfortunately, I got an infection in my wound which went on for six months and included two um, weeks in a hospital, a local hospital. I was concerned there and, and upset because if the majority of nurses in the hospital didn't appear to know anything about bladder cancer. Um, and certainly um, some of the time I, I felt that I was telling them what I needed. Um, which is okay, because you should be able to tell people what you need. But I think it would be nice when you're feeling really ill and somebody knows what they're doing. Um, my um, infection took six months to heal. But during that time, I was seen by my consultant at the Western General in Edinburgh. And everywhere I went, I looked for information on bladder cancer. And everywhere I went, I couldn't find any. So I asked my consultant if he knew how I could give something back, because I really felt that I was grateful to be alive. I felt that in many ways I'd had a really good service, though I'd had some bad experiences in between. 
Um, and he said to me that he had heard of somebody called Andrew Winterbottom and he would try and get me his number. And thankfully he did. Andrew rang me up, told me about, told me that he had, he was a patient, he had been a patient and that he'd set up a charity um, type bladder cancer UK. Uh, I think that was an amazing part of my journey. Um, he was an amazing man and I was fortunate enough to attend two conferences with Andrew to promote awareness of bladder cancer. Um, the more I got involved with giving out information and doing information stores, I realised how little people knew. Um, I was born in a Welsh, I brought up in a Welsh village. Um, so I'd always had an interest in politics and I was also aware of the influence that politics can have on people's lives. So I discussed with Andrew the idea of pro approaching the Scottish Parliament. He felt that that would be positive and in 2018, with the support of another young, a young patient and um, a, a consultant, we started approaching MSPs. Um, it was not a quick journey and we, heard, we got very little feedback in 2018, but to our surprise in 2019, we got invited to meet one of the Scottish ministers and the leader of the Lim Dem. The result of that was that we got um, the offer from an MSP to set a motion for us and this was lodged in Parliament and we got 35 MSP from all parties supporting it. The bill was to raise awareness and to influence policy. Um, COVID came, so we didn't get a debate, which we'd hoped for. However, you will know that on the 6th of May this year, we had an election to the Scottish Parliament. We took the names of everybody as they were elected. Um, and on the day of their election, we sent them a congratulation email and telling that, reminding them that fight bladder cancer, that bladder cancer was still a, an issue within Scotland and the UK and asking for their support. We were very happy to see several re, very positive responses within a few days, saying that they would be happy to help us in the future. Um, so we tend to go back we now have a steering group in Scotland, a Scottish steering group looking at setting up an arm of the charity in Scotland. And so we're going to discuss a list of priorities which we to take to the Scottish government. And hopefully that we will be able to change some of the policies that are about at present. My journey has been different. It's, there's been days when it's been okay and there's been days when it's not been so okay. There's been days when the service was good and there were days when the service was terrible. And somehow I, I feel that part of the problem was that for lots of people, and I've made lots of friends and, and I buddy, so I've met lots of people from both Scotland and England, that there is no clear pathway, nobody knows what to expect. So I think the exemplar project, project gives us a clear path. Uh, I think the way the path goes might be different in different areas, but I do think this is an opportunity for people to get together so that everybody has a choice. Everybody knows what they can expect. And it, I think knowledge empowers, but it also makes people accountable. And I think that, um, with all the expertise which is available in the four nations, we should be able to move forward with an amazing um, service for bladder cancers. I was thinking about the fact that charities have always led the way historically. Um, and if we look at the National Health Service um, in South Wales, prior, prior to the formation of the National Health Service, it was the charities and friend societies which provided medical treatment and hospitals, some which were later incorporated into the NHS after its formation. And I think, well, if that happened in Wales uh, in all those in all those years ago in the 40s, then surely 
fight bladder cancer and the people who support it and the expertise they are, it, there is an amazing possibility of what can happen with this research and how we can take it forward. Um, and I'm really excited and I'm really grateful for Fight Bladder Cancer for all the opportunities he's given myself and my husband. Um, and I'm really excited about how we move forward and how other people have the experiences, the positive experiences that I've had. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dorothy. It's really a pleasure working with you. Um, I'm so impressed by everything you've already achieved in Scotland, around the UK, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do in the future. So thank you so much, Dorothy, for the introduction, for sharing your story and your passion. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I will talk about the Exemplar project itself and the research that we've conducted. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the Exemplar Project Objectives. It's a four-year project uh, which has just come to fruition. So I'm just so pleased to see all of these years of research together. Uh, so uh, these are the four main objectives, uh, to collect views and experiences of people affected by bladder cancer, their families and healthcare professionals in the UK, uh, then to summarize the strengths and gaps in current bladder cancer services provisions from the health service user and healthcare professional perspective to identify steps required to enhance the strengths and bridge the gaps in current services and also to identify the priorities of the stakeholders to inform the development of future service guidelines and research projects. Next slide please. So these uh, the four stages. So uh, in 2017 and 2018, Fight Bladder Cancer conducted project scoping and then in 2018, a guidelines review to see what was currently within the guidelines in 2018. And those two pillars were then used to uh, form the basis of interviews with healthcare professionals, which was complete in 2018. And then the final pillar were the interviews with patients and carers, uh, which was complete uh, in 2020. Uh, we made sure here um, to make sure that this was a, a qualitative uh, methodology with a focus on understanding views, uh, perceptions and uh, experiences. Uh, and it, we also used a rigorous and ethical research design here led by a steering group of key clinicians, academics uh, and people with bladder cancer. These interviews were semi-structured. Uh, so we had 17 interviews with healthcare professionals that were geographically spread across the UK, including urology, oncology, medical oncology, and clinical nurse specialists. Uh, and then the interviews with people affected the UK, once again, they were all over the United Kingdom, uh, the Southeast, Northern Ireland, East of England, Scotland, Yorkshire, and the Humber, London, and Wales. Uh, people aged um, from 41 to 87. We interviewed both carers and family members and people living with bladder cancer. Uh, we also made sure that we interviewed people with different types of bladder cancer uh, diagnoses. Uh, next slide, please. So the findings and recommendation areas, uh, we have divided the findings, the recommendations, and today's session into three pillars. One, uh, putting in place an exemplar pathway. Two, developing and growing the bladder cancer workforce. And three, improving patient support and involvement in care. Next slide, please. So this is session one, putting in place an exemplar pathway. And we have two amazing speakers for this session, uh, Dr. Johnson Shaw and Mr. Hugh Mostafford. Uh, so um, I will ask them both to introduce themselves. I will just bring them up on the screen. Uh, so Hugh and Johnston. Uh, so uh, Hugh and Johnson, um, Johnson, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and then Hugh, perhaps you can introduce yourself after that. Hi, um, are you receiving me? <laughs> yeah, I'm Johnson yes. Shaw. Yes. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you for your um, introduction. Uh, and it's also a very difficult act to follow Dorothy, who I know very well and has, in fact, supported me through my um, journey in our support group. So thank you to Dorothy in so many ways. Um, a difficult act to follow indeed. I hope you notice that I too, as well as Dorothy, have my T-shirt on. Um, I had to make sure I had my orange t-shirt on, which metaphorically I got um, two years ago. 
Um, I had been working as a GP for over 35 years um, in a practice, very busy practice, just close to Edinburgh. And I also retired when I became ill and had a radical cystoprostatectomy about two years ago now, almost exactly to the day. Um, I'll come on to various different things, but the bit we're starting on is the standardised pathway for patients with bladder cancer in the UK. And at the moment, as we'll discuss, it's a very fragmented system, even getting into it prior to even getting referred anywhere. Um, there's no set way of people and patients identifying or being identified. They may go through their general practitioner in the UK through primary care, having been seen by a pharmacist perhaps um, with prescriptions for antibiotics. They may see their GP several times. They may be referred to general urology. They may go to gynecology and be on that waiting list for a long time. Um, so it's quite a complex pathway and it needs to be standardized. People in primary care, for example, can be quite complex. They come in with very difficult different conditions. When they walk through the door, they don't have the right t-shirt on. You know, the bladder cancer patient doesn't have the orange t-shirt on like I do. Um, they may have the different t-shirt or they may have the wrong t-shirt on. So it's quite a skill to be able to diagnose the patient in the first place with the appropriate symptoms before you start getting on that pathway and onward referral. And as we'll discuss, and Hugh's going to come on in several minutes to discuss our gold standard pathway is to identify these patients more efficiently, effectively and quicker, and then get them into a standardised gold standard one-stop shop where the patients are diagnosed and their treatment plan is then identified and all the imaging is all done at the same time. So the next bit we wanted to talk about was, and it's easy as a 65 year old GP, when I developed blood in my urine or hematuria and um, to identify myself and get myself diagnosed by my GP and referred on to, we have a very good one-stop shop hematuria clinic in Edinburgh. But as the report very well points out, there is good evidence that women of all ages with recurrent UTIs have, they're experiencing great difficulties in getting their symptoms across, and there's massive delays in diagnosis, as Dorothy's already alluded to. And referral and long waiting lists leads to really quite poor experiences of these patients, which we need to try and sort out, and ultimately poor outcomes. And I'll maybe hand on to Hugh now. So um, part of this uh, fragmented uh, pathway continues when the patient comes into hospital. The first operation that most bladder cancer patients have is something called a transurethral resection of a bladder tumour, or TURBT for short. So we put a small telescope in and remove uh, the visible tumour. Uh, one of the anomalies that has existed for some time within uh, NHS England is that um, when the patient has had their TURBT, uh, as far as uh, NHS England was concerned, in effect, um, the uh, cancer target clock, if you like, then stopped at that point. So in other words, um, whatever subsequent treatment the patient required, and we've just heard that you may even need to go on to have a big operation to have your bladder removed, as far as um, the waiting time uh, scrutiny was concerned, that first operation stopped the clock. So there was no one really watching how long it then took to have, for example, a cystectomy. And this was an anomaly. There were no other cancers that um, was, were like this. And, and um, um, a lot of people, uh, Lydia, Andrew, and many other people, were involved with um, speaking to people at NHS England um, and trying to get that uh, changed. Uh, so I'm speaking specifically uh, in England because I know in, in uh, the, some of the uh, other devolved countries they had other arrangements. Um, 
Johnson, I don't know if you want to just carry on regarding the continuity of care or, um, but, but, but in any case, um, when patients uh, did have their operation, um, again, there, there are lots of different um, ways that um, different hospitals uh, decide how to provide continuity of care whether it's provided by uh, nurses predominantly or whether it's mainly uh, led by doctors. Uh, and certainly it, it's one area because a lot of bladder cancer patients have to have ongoing uh, investigations and treatment, it can be uh, quite confusing for them. Uh, next slide. Yes, I'll pick up uh, back here again. Um, we're looking at the national guidelines. Um, and at the moment, um, there, that's where we need to think of where we're picking up the patients and urgently identifying them and getting them into the system as quickly as possible. Um, I'll talk about the national guidelines that we have in the UK in a moment. Um, but it can be quite confusing looking at all the different guidelines that are around nationally and locally. If we take on, first of all, I spoke about my own experience with visible hematuria or blood in the pee. Um, in the older age groups, particularly men over 60, um, we're easy to identify. And you get into the system, you get your two week cancer, urgent cancer referral. Um, the younger patients with persistent blood in their urine after treatment, perhaps for urinary tract infections are being missed. And the current guidelines aren't really identifying them. And there isn't a lot of awareness in my mind um, that these patients are being identified quickly enough. I'm going to come back to UTIs or urinary tract infections in a moment. <clears throat> in the UK, we have the gold standard NICE guidelines or the National Institute for Clinical Excellence and the Scottish Cancer Referral Guidelines. And you'll see on the slide that they state that an active monitoring strategy may be appropriate and have a safety net available. But in my experience, particularly as a GP, after 35 years, often when you are talking to patients, you've got to listen to them properly and Dor Dorothy outlined that very well in her introduction. You've got to look for that cancer alarm bell and that cancer alarm bell may not specifically be mentioned in these national guidelines. And if the GP, or it could be nowadays a nurse practitioner or a paramedic or a pharmacist that's seeing the patient, to wade through quite complicated guidelines can be quite challenging. So they need to be a bit better to um, identify. In Edinburgh, we have guidelines on our phone that we can look at, which are very user friendly and are quite specific about what symptoms to look for and when to refer. So the situation, we're going to go on to where it might be um, acceptable to observe people um, for a while is non-visible blood in the urine, um, and there may not be any other alarm features. The GP needs to identify, particularly in those over 60s, if there's a high white, white count in their blood or dysuria, then they need to be referred on as quickly as possible. I'll come back to urinary tract infections again, <clears throat> because the other situation and minefield, in my view, is observing or not referring people with recurrent UTIs. And there's a large potential for people not to be referred. And again, the guidelines are quite vague. Some of them will say that after three UTIs, you then go on to conservative management and observation of the patient, perhaps give them advice about fluid intake, the use of cranberry juice, and um, hormone replacement therapy, but there'll be no mechanism for drawing that patient back in, particularly if they develop hematuria, blood in their urine, and they don't know that they're meant to go back and get referred or something else happens. So that's, <laughs> at the moment, if you're over 60 in some areas with recurrent UTIs, you'll go into a cancer referral, but otherwise you'll get whatever age you are, 
at the moment, you won't be referred unless you're in the older age group. Um, but in, the, in any age group, you may have a non-urgent referral. And I'll maybe get Hugh to speak about that in a minute or two in his next slide. But that could mean months of waiting um, before you then get investigated. And that's time lost with the cancer um, clock going. <laughs> I'll maybe move on to the next slide with you. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that we need to do once the patient's been referred into hospital and we can we can come back to how we pick up, how, what's the best way to pick up bladder cancer patients in, in primary care during the discussion. Uh, but once they arrive uh, with us, I think one of the really important things is that, as I said, um, NHS England has uh, reclassified TURBT as a diagnostic procedure. So that means that the clock continues to tick until the patient has received their definitive treatment, which may be radiotherapy, it may be cystectomy, it may even be uh, uh, the BCG treatment into their bladder. Uh, and what we need to do is to try, uh, try and uh, <clears throat> persuade the other nations, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, to implement this so that we have a consistent uh, set of rules uh, across the whole uh, of the British Isles. And um, I think consistency is one of the issues that comes across in uh, bladder cancer care. Uh, one of the things that really strikes me is that for many other cancers, let's take, for example, breast or colorectal cancer, um, wherever you go in the country, the pathway is pretty much exactly the same. And uh, bladder cancer is really yet to catch up with that. And I think just even being able to reclassify TURBT as a diagnostic procedure, uh, wherever you are in the country, um, would be uh, a first step. And the other thing that I think we need to do is to improve um, the way we investigate patients when they arrive. There's no doubt that patients overwhelmingly prefer to have all their investigations done at one visit uh, rather than having it fragmented. So for example, coming in, having uh, an outpatient consultation and then being told you then need to have a separate test to look inside your bladder and then a separate visit to have a CT scan uh, clearly, that's really frustrating, and uh, it would be much better for them to come in and have a one-stop investigation. Uh, and as logical as that may seem, it's still not consistent across uh, the country. And one other issue, which I think, Johnson, would be quite interesting to take, get your view on this, because I know we had some discussions beforehand, is also... Uh, having some consistency when patient comes back to have their diagnosis explained to them and the way we um, as um, uh, healthcare providers uh, break um, bad news in particular. Uh, I yes. think, Johnson, have you, have you got any thoughts on that? Yes, thank you. I'll come back in there. Uh, I think with all patients, and I'm sure there are a few of you around here today, most cancer patients will have had some kind of experience that will have been bad for them and they will stick in their mind and no matter what anybody does you'll reflect back on that experience and communicate communication is one of my things that i'm really keen about getting right and if communication is wrong at any kind of stage. And that can be in primary care, secondary care, any clinician or professional that's dealing with a patient. If they get that wrong, the patient's going to have that in their mind and it's going to spoil their experience. So I think that's why if we're developing, particularly the gold standard hematuria elaborate diagnostic clinics, taking all patients in, there needs to be some mechanism to make sure that, that clinician that's breaking the bad news to a patient is able to cope with it well and is able to maybe give them a bit more explanation about what's going to happen. Um, and 
what the pathway is likely to look like over the next few weeks because they're going to be absolutely terrified. I can, I can say that from my experience, <laughs> although the rapid diagnostic clinic is fantastic, um, it may come up in the discussion, but lying there naked on an operating table with several people looking on and getting told you've got bladder cancer isn't one of the best experiences of my life, I have to say. So really for other patients, I'd like to see that bit go a bit better. Yeah, th thanks, Johnson. I think even just having that discussion with you uh, really made me reflect and um, think how we do that in, in Guildford, where we work. Uh, and then I think one of the last points, which is so important, given everything that has happened in the last year, which has uh, affected everyone, uh, is to really try and reassure and support patients with these symptoms um, in, in, uh, in the community that they must uh, really try and report these symptoms if they've got blood in the urine and to, to reassure them that things have pretty much returned to normal in terms of uh, diagnosing these things quickly in hospital and that they are completely safe coming into hospital to have these investigations done so they really don't need to worry about um, you know anything like um, catching COVID or anything else in hospital and, and, and really they must come forward so that we can in investigate them without there being a delay. Uh, we move on to the next slide? Yeah yeah thank you Hugh. And um, finally, thank you very much for asking me to speak. And in summary of our little bit, I hope we've identified some of the issues that the exemplar report has highlighted in identifying the best pathway for bladder cancer identification and moving on to the next stages of diagnosis and treatment. So fight bladder cancer can do quite an amazing job, I'm quite sure, in bringing together all the people, professionals, and that crucially has to be, I hope I've put the message across that primary care needs to be involved as well as secondary care with all the different professionals that are involved, doctors, nurses, um, patients and carers. And crucially, in my experience in developing a lot of these pathways in different um, situations is that often the decisions will be made at the top and fed down to those that are working on the cold face, so to speak, either in primary care or in the hospitals and secondary care and urology and bladder cancer. So crucially, that discussion needs to be done with everybody else. So it's not a top down approach and the decisions are made and handed down to us. Thank you, Hugh. Yeah, and so really just um, drawing this uh, session to an end, um, uh, one of the, the strong recommendations uh, from this report is that there should be um, a funded, uh, academically driven uh, analysis of the, the cost-benefit ratios. In other words, um, making sure that for every pound that we spend on bladder cancer services, we extract the maximum amount of benefit for the patients from the money that we're spending on it. And, and this really just goes back to what we were saying, that there are lots of different approaches in different places and not all of them can all be cost effective. So it's really just about reducing, trying to work out where the best ways are would be, would be to reduce variation, getting the best value for the money that we spend on these services and really trying to improve the areas in the pathway that would lead to the biggest impact and benefit for the patients uh, and also in the quickest possible time. So. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Johnston, um, for your overview. It's really fantastic to get your perspective as a carer, a GP, a, a patient and, uh, and a physician. So thank you. Um, so um, I will now launch a uh, poll. Uh, so you can see that we outlined here 
uh, recommendations for what we can do now and also then what recommendations for what we should be thinking about long term. So for uh, everyone watching at home, I will launch a poll um, here, uh, which is the question about uh, what is what for you, what is the top priority for action um, in the next 12 months? Um, the national guide, referral guidelines should be reviewed. Uh, if a GP determines that an active monitoring strategy is more appropriate than referral, it is important for the GP to provide a safety net. Reclassification of TURBT as a diagnostic procedure must be prioritised. Uh, existing hematuria rapid diagnostic clinics should be reviewed. Every clinician involved in possibly breaking bad news to a, should a patient should be trained uh, and everyone with suspected and confirmed bladder cancer should be supported to return to healthcare services. So we can see here that the majority of people are saying that uh, national referral guidelines uh, should be reviewed. Uh, and we're also seeing a lot of interest in reclassification of TURBT and looking at uh, these hematuria rapid diagnostic clinics. So thank you. Um, thank you. If you cannot see the poll, um, you should just, it should just be the window behind, uh, behind your current window. So that, um, that should come up. Um, but I do see that most people have voted. So thank you. Um, Laura, if you could stop sharing your screen and we will, and I will now share the results. Um, so now you should be able to see the results. Um, yeah, so we can see that 42% of people said uh, that national referral guidelines should be reviewed. And then uh, one quarter of people said reclassification of TORBT as a diagnostic procedure must be prioritised. So we have some questions um, from the audience. Um, the first is um, David Day. So I will ask um, David to see if he can. Right. So David, you had a question. Um, I will, um, if you can just unmute yourself, um, feel free to ask Anne Johnston and Hugh. So David is, uh, if you wanna introduce yourself briefly and then ask your question to Hugh and Johnston. There you go. Hello. Sorry about that. I'm having a bit of Wi-Fi issues today. Um, no, I think my my question was um, regarding the first thing when you discover uh, blood in your urine. Um, it's the length of time that you're going to the GP and getting the referral. Is that part? Is that was that part of in in the survey in the report to? improve that time scale and possibly to um, have GPs more aware of uh, of bladder cancer and I, I, I was lucky I, I, I was sent straight for a referral and got a, um, the camera within weeks um, and then turb done within weeks as well. So I was very lucky, but I do hear through forums that I've been involved with that there is quite a delay in from a GP to getting the referral because they're not aware it might be just a UTI rather than actual bladder cancer. Um, do you want me to pick on that, um, Lydia, first and then hand on to you perhaps? Well, yeah, as hopefully we've tried to point out, the easy bit is the older man, which is both of us, yeah. with blood in the urine. And, and that should trigger an urgent referral. Um, and that should happen immediately within the two week period. So that a cancer referral should happen to the specialist at the hospital. Okay. Hopefully we're saying to the rapid diagnostic hematuria clinic. Um, 
you are quite right to raise the issue, and that's like exactly what the exemplar project has identified. And hopefully, we're trying to express this afternoon that the other patients are those that are being lost and that we're needing to pick up a lot, a lot quicker. And in that context of just the volume of patients that might be seen at the point where you need to be diagnosed, um, over 35 years, um, I experienced four bladder cancer patients in my whole career, and I was one of them. I only had another three. So that they can be quite rare, and yet you will see hundreds, if not thousands, of patients with urinary tract infections. Yeah. And you're absolutely spot on that there needs to be a lot of awareness, not just with patients in the public, but with general practitioners. Um, yeah. And more increasingly, um, patients in primary care will be seen by nurse practitioners as well. So they need to be involved as well. So you're absolutely spot on. And that's where Fight Bladder Cancer can help with this project and yeah. helping to raise awareness and tighten up these guidelines. And the guidelines not only need to be national, but they need to be local. So that there's discussion between the clinicians locally. Um, so I don't know what you maybe wants to add something in about how he works with the general practitioners and other professionals locally to make sure that they're aware of the services that they're providing and the best ways of them being referred into and being dealt with quickly if they need to be. And the other point, and I know that Hugh probably may have something to say about this because we've spoken about this separately, is the long time that patients with um, recurrent urinary tract infections may have to wait to be seen, particularly post-COVID. In some areas, recurrent UTIs over 60 will be seen as a cancer referral, but in most areas, um, they'll be seen as non-urgent referrals, which could take, in my experience, um, over a year. Yeah, um, thanks, Johnson. Um, I think the, um, I mean, as someone who works in hospital, um, I really um, have to say that I think most of the time our colleagues in primary care have got an incredibly difficult job. And uh, sometimes it's easy with the benefit of hindsight to look back on something and say, well, um, you know, could this have been referred earlier or whatever? Uh, my my view really is that actually most of the time the referral process works really well, but there is maybe one in four patients you know who are diagnosed with bladder cancer presented in a slightly atypical manner. So in other words, um, they may not have presented with blood in the urine, but they presented with what to all intents and purposes look like one of the many thousands of urinary tract infections that um, Johnston was talking about. So there is that issue. And I think the other thing that has always really surprised me is when you talk to some patients who um, have been diagnosed with bladder cancer, they had visible blood in the urine before they went to see their GP for some time, but they just didn't know that it was serious. And I think that's one of the other things that we need to do is no matter how much we improve the primary care aspect of it, if the patients aren't going to see their GP in a timely manner with blood in the urine, then there's already a bit of a delay. So we, we all really need to try and raise public awareness so that people, as soon as they see blood in the urine or anything else that worries them, they go and see their GP and they don't. Um, continue for a while because even that can cause a big delay. Very good. Yeah, because I, I just just to add on to just that, to to the advert that was on a few years ago um, that was on constantly is constantly. what is what got me to go to the GP because I had blood in my urine. Um, now I know it's been done again recently, but um, it's not. It's, I don't know whether it's due to come back on again um, on media, you know, TV or, or, or whatever, but it definitely got me to go to the GP. Well, it's good to hear, uh, David, that the Blood mm -hmm. MP campaigns have been successful. 
Um, and it's it's wonderful to hear that it, it was that messaging that got you to see a GP. And yes, we definitely need to encourage the NHS to run the blood MP campaigns again because they have been very successful. And we do need that public awareness of all the signs and symptoms of bladder cancer, not just blood and pee, as you said earlier, Hugh, that one in four might have a typical presentation as well. So that's um, that's very important. Um, we also have another question here um, from Tom Gamble, um, who asks, how do the different definitions of TURBT treatment diagnostic uh, affect patients living in England um, that are referred to a Welsh or a Scottish hospital as well? Um, so where does the clock stop? Well, you can maybe remind me, but the situation is different in Scotland and in England. In Scotland, the clock actually continues to click, tick or talk or whatever the description is. Once you've had your two year RBT, that doesn't count as um, it counts as as a as a treatment rather than a diagnosis. Whereas in England, I think you've been able to change things. So that is a priority in Scotland. And I think to give Dorothy her view um, some credit there, I think that's something she's been working with the Scottish Parliament on. Um, she can maybe pick me up and remind me about that. But certainly th there is a problem in Scotland with that. And that, uh, that can create quite a bit of time between when you're diagnosed um, with your cancer, lying there in the one-stop shop, naked, getting told that you've got your bladder cancer, and then you might wait at least another two, three months before you're getting your radical cystectomy or longer. Um, and other patients may pick me up on that. But the time you wait from your diagnosis to your definitive treatment is just a nightmare. Yeah. Um, I, I'm afraid off the top of my head, I don't know the exact um, arrangements in, in Wales and Northern Ireland and, and, and uh, where there may be some differences with uh, the practice in NHS England. Yeah, uh, I think that there is definitely some work to be done in Wales and Northern Ireland that it is not, uh, I think it is facing the similar issues as well. And we definitely need to work in Wales and Northern Ireland to make sure that TURBT is only classified as a definitive treatment when it is actually removing the whole tumour. And if it is a simple biopsy, then then it should not be classified as that. And then when we're measuring the time from urgent referral to the time of definitive treatment, then we're really stopping the clock at the appropriate time and work is definitely needed in Northern Ireland and Wales. Uh, and then I think in England as well, although now the guidelines have changed, we need to do work within the various trusts as well to make sure that people understand that the guidelines have changed and they do need to be changing the way that they're working. Yeah. We have another poll uh, for the audience uh, as well. So I will pull this up. Um, and so another thing that we discussed here are the long-term uh, priorities for improving the patient pathway. And we talked about two prior main priorities here. One, a national conversation on what an optimal pathway for bladder cancer should look like across the UK and two, an academic cost-benefit analysis of current bladder cancer services and possible pathway improvements. So you all have the opportunity to vote on this. So I will give everyone five more seconds of voting. Okay, it's, uh, it's a close one actually here. So I am sharing the results now here. So uh, by a small margin, uh, a national conversation on what an optimal pathway for bladder cancer should look like across um, the UK. Uh, people have identified as a slightly higher priority, but we still have 41% of people who've said an academic cost-benefit analysis of current bladder cancer services and possible pathway improvements. So, uh, so we will definitely take that into, uh, into account. 
So um, Hugh and Johnston, we most of the people watching this have voted for a national conversation on what an optimal bladder cancer pathway would look like. Um, if you could make one change and if you could say, what would you want to see in an exemplar um, bladder cancer pathway? What, what would you put into this? What would you say during this national conversation? So I'll start with Johnston. Well, I'd, I'd like to see the gold standard being the one-stop shop, but not just for hematuria and blood in the urine, but for all patients and for it definitely to be a two-week um, waiting list from when the clock starts. Um, and that has to probably include the patients that we've discussed, which are a bit more difficult to diagnose. And these are the ones that I'm worried about. Um, so the awareness campaigns, both with patients and G GPs, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, everybody is really crucial in doing that. Thank you, Johnston. And Hugh, what would you like to see? Um, I think con consistency. Um, and um, I always remember having a conversation with Andrew actually, and uh, recounting the story that um, a relative of mine uh, rang me to say that they'd been unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer. And could I recommend, um, you know, someone good where they lived? And so I went and asked my local breast surgeon. And the answer really slightly took me by surprise. He just said, we have totally consistent guidelines across the country. It doesn't matter where, they go, they will get exactly the same pathway as they would coming down here to see me or anywhere else. And I remember I was actually completely surprised because it just doesn't happen like that in bladder cancer. So I think, to put it simply, uh, it just doesn't make any sense um, that if you go to X, you have your test done in a certain sequence, you may not get this test done. Uh, and so on and so forth. It, it should be every single bladder cancer patient should be able to tell you the same pathway that they had, irrespective of where they were treated, in, in which hospital. I just think that's really crucial. Thank you, Hugh. Um, and we've had another question come through uh, that says, what differences do you see uh, between the bladder cancer I'm sorry, Lydia, I didn't hear that question. No, I didn't. Was there. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, uh, possible question. Um, so the question that came through is, uh, what differences do you see between the bladder cancer pathway and other urological cancers? Are there things we can learn from the rapid diagnostic pathway in prostate? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes, because prostate is uh, a long way ahead of bladder and pretty much is caught up with the other very big cancers such as breast cancer and colorectal cancer in terms of being consistent and there being very little variation depending on where, where you go. It's all pretty much done in a similar fashion. Um, so I, I do think that even within urology, we have uh, a very good example of which direction we should be going in terms of um, making a uh, pathway pretty much identical, irrespective of which hospital you end up being referred to. Yeah, I would echo that. And going back to my analogy right at the beginning, the, the t-shirts for prostate cancer and breast cancer come out of the drawer much more easily um, when the patients come through the door mainly because of patient awareness. I even saw in Breakfast News this morning, there's a big campaign um, for Prostate Cancer UK today that's been launched with Bob Willis, the cricketer who died for prostate cancer. So these are the things that raise awareness with patients. Um, but crucially with GPs, uh, all those working in primary care, um, for the reasons I identified earlier on, that we're not, we're not seeing a lot of patients with bladder cancer. 
So the bladder cancer alarm bell doesn't ring as soon as it should do. It rings earlier with breast cancer and prostate cancer because they're easier things to identify and because they're being talked about and we're seeing more patients. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think that's a very valid point. Um, so uh, also to all the attendees watching as well, um, how, how do we progress um, this national conversation? So how do we advocate as a community for implementation of the recommendations? And what should our next steps be um, in these areas? So uh, I'd invite comments, uh, feel free to share your comments in the, in the chat. Um, and uh, for example, Anne has asked, um, she would be interested to know who Johnson and Hugh Mustaford think should be involved in this discussion. Well, I mean, I've always felt that it should be the patients that should be involved. And um, I think they're absolutely critical. I mean, I think as urologists, our responsibility is to ensure that we provide the highest quality care to, uh, to the patients, um, first and foremost. But, you know, I think the patients uh, are extremely important. In, in one in two ways one is to tell us how we can improve our services um, but also equally i think they do play a very important role in terms of really understanding how we can reach out to, to people in the community for example as we we're saying about patients coming forward after covid patients who've got blood in the urine who are scared um, these are things that people who've already been through that experience are going to be extremely knowledgeable in terms of telling us how we can improve those aspects of our care. Thank you. Yes, I would echo that. Over my years, I did a lot of teaching um, with um, doctors in training, both in primary and secondary care, and my mantra was always listen to the patient. So he was just underlined that, um, I think. Professions need to listen to the patients, certainly, but not also that. The professions need to talk to each other, get their heads together and work out the pathways with these patients. So primary care, secondary care can't work on their own to get that pathway right. They need to work together. Um, there are lots of ways that are perhaps out with the scope of, of today to, to, to organise that, but that's crucially what needs to be done. Yes, and how can we help GPs? How can we improve those links between primary and secondary care? Good question. I mean, there, there are there are set forums for doing that. There are cancer working groups within the College of Surgeons and the College of GPs. And with the academies of colleges, they speak to each other. And it's just trying to get that to the top of the agenda um, is fight bladder cancer's role in that process. Um, so it's probably further down the agenda than it should be. So it's trying to get up the ladder of discussion between them for folk to get together and do that. And then it gets onto the next stage, which is, becomes more political, certainly. But that's that's the first step, I would think. Thank you, Johnston. Um, and so we've got one final question uh, about integrated care systems in England. So the question is, how will integrated care systems in England help or hinder national consistency? being encouraged in bladder cancer pathway. Will every integrated care system be able to instigate a regional bladder cancer pathway, which they believe is best practice, but ultimately increases variation uh, between integrated care system regions? I'm not sure if either of you want to answer that. Um, well, maybe I can, I can have a go. I mean, we're quite lucky in that we have already set up uh, a regional bladder cancer uh, service in, in Guildford into which um, six and now about to be seven of our local hospitals uh, refer into. Um, and I think three of those are going to be part of our integrated care service. And I think it represents a really excellent opportunity for us to all sit down as clinicians and find out what each hospital does well and try and put it all, bring it all together. So I think we've got 
things to learn from other hospitals and hopefully they may have something to learn from us. And I think we need to work as teams and the, um, the old model of a single consultant being the one and an only person that a patient is referred to and he knows best and he decides everything, I think is somewhat outdated and we need to work as teams and constantly look at how we can improve um, the urological care that we provide for the patients. So hopefully I think it will help. Thank you. Uh, and for people who are unfamiliar with this, uh, so the NHS released a, a long-term plan uh, which confirmed that all parts of England would be served by an integrated care system. Uh, and so the aim of these integrated care systems are to forge new partnerships um, between the various organisations that meet the health and care needs across an area uh, with the aim of hopefully having more coordinated services. So um, it'll be interesting now that we are at the beginning of this to, to see how this actually works in practice. So uh, thank you everyone um, for all of your questions uh, and discussions about uh, session one, uh, which was about how we can uh, put in place an exemplar pathway. Uh, to, to summarize some of the points that have been raised, uh, we emphasize the fact that national referral guidelines uh, desperately need to be reviewed, uh, especially when it comes to women, uh, that TURBT needs to be examined, uh, that we've made some small successes in England, but we need to make sure that in the other devolved nations as well, that TURBT is only recognized as definitive treatment when it is indeed definitive treatment, uh, and that uh, rapid access hematuria clinics as well should be examined. We've got some great ones around the country, and it would be fantastic if everyone with hematuria could have a, a rapid diagnostic clinic. Uh, Hugh raised the fact uh, that one in four people present with atypical symptoms as well, especially women, and so we need to make sure that we're giving GPs the tools uh, to, to recognise that. Uh, and uh, we also heard about the importance of the blood and pee campaign that the NHS runs and how that can really help people drive uh, the conversation with their GP and drive that uh, presentation to the GP and then referral by the GP. We talked about how a long-term goal uh, is needed uh, and the first step of that is a national conversation about uh, the bladder cancer pathway, especially the two-week referral uh, consistency between different regions uh, within the country uh, and how we can also learn from prostate cancer as well. So that was a really, really fantastic conversation. Uh, so thank you everyone for your contributions. <laughs>